Can you hear me? So my topic is perturbative QCDA. And before we talk about perturbative QCD, let me, which is an old topic, I mean, going back to the early 70s, and it's still, the thing I want to emphasize is it's still really much alive today. So if you look at papers on the archive and you say, what's that paper about and what's kind of the ingredients that go into that paper, more than 50% of the time it's going to be about QCD. So people are still very actively working on this topic. And so it, just to give you a sort of picture of why that is, let me give you a few connections of QCD to other areas of particle physics. So one example, which is related to the lectures that you just heard from Yossi, is CP violation in flavor physics. And the reason that QCD is relevant here is because we're talking about things like a B meson, which is a hadron, and it's confined. So there's QCD physics involved in understanding CP violation in flavor. And there's strong phases as well as the weak phases that are CP violating, and you have to understand both of those things in general to understand what's going on in, in a CP violating process. If you go to the LHC, which is going to be the topic of these lectures, then you're oftentimes thinking of it as a beyond the standard model machine. You're after looking uh, for new physics, but it's also a place where you can test the standard model in a precision way. So let me say precision SM for standard model physics. And that's kind of in a collider environment. So that's actually going to be the main topic of these lectures that I'll give, is talking about QCD in a collider environment. There's also other collisions that are interesting. So you can go to high temperature or high dens density. And this is the realm of heavy ion physics at least for high temperature. And that's also something that's done at the LHC. And that's also deeply involves QCD, because we're talking about uh, producing a soup of quarks and gluons. And the list goes on and on. If you want to just understand quantum field theory, then QCD is really a prototypical non-abelian gauge theory. And for, so a lot of times, people just study aspects of QCD to understand aspects of quantum field theory. Nuclear physics should be in the list. So the physics of nucleons and pions, and nuclei, is also something that's QCD, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so there's a lot of physics here. We're only going to touch on the basics in the lectures I'm going to give. And by way of motivation, I want to talk about the LHC, because that's the, you know, the hot machine that is probing QCD these days. And I want to talk about an LHC collision and what it looks like. And that'll give you an idea of some of the things that go into, the complications that go into understanding QCD. So I'm going to draw a picture here. The picture is going to be of two protons colliding. Well, a proton is something that's made up of three quarks. I'm going to try to use colors here. We'll see if there are visible to you. So we send one proton in from one direction. We send another proton in from the other direction at very high energies. And the idea of doing that at very high energies is to probe very sh short distances. So what we're after probing inside this box might be distance scales that are of order 10 to the I minus 18 meters. And the typical scale associated to the proton, if you like, the size of the proton is something more like 10 to the minus 15 meters. So we're sending in these uh, protons to make a very high energy collision between the quarks that are inside the proton or the partons that are inside the proton to probe very short distance scales, high energy, short distance. And in this process, there's going to be lots of interactions, because QCD, is a, by its nature, is strongly interacting. So the coupling is large. And so all sorts of things can happen. In particular, there, could be, there will be gluons that are inside here as well. And actually, the process I want to talk about is not a collision of the quarks, but a collision of gluons. So let me take a gluon out of the proton and let it collide with another gluon in the proton. And out of that, I could produce something like a Higgs boson, 
And maybe the Higgs boson decays to two photons. We tried another short distance process. And accompanying that thing that we'd like to study, which is Higgs bosons, there's going to be other things, including what are called jets. That'll be one of the topics of lectures today. Uh, the following lectures that we'll talk about. So what is a jet? So we start with this initial gluon, and then it has a branching process that it goes through, where it splits into other gluons or quark pairs. And that process continues until at some point these, we get to long distance again, and there's hadronization of those quarks and gluons back into a bunch of hadrons, back into things like the proton or pi, mostly actually pions. So this overall thing is what we call a jet. It's a collimated spray of radiation. And then there's this process where the quarks changed into hadrons that happened here, and we call that process hadronization. And so here's one jet. There could be another one over here. Okay. The same thing happening. Second collimated jet. And these kind of jets here I've drawn as if they're coming from the short distance interaction. So they're coming out of this box. I'll tell you what's in the box in a few minutes. There could also be jets that are initiated by, say, the, the radiation that's coming into the process. So maybe this, our gluon fits off a gluon, and that gluon forms a jet. Usually these jets are pretty forward, so this is some forward jet. And these jets are at large transverse momentum, perpendicular to the direction of the collision. So these are some of the aspects of, of what you actually see in an event. You don't see quarks and gluons. You see these jets. That's how we observe quarks and gluons. And if we're after studying this Higgs boson, it's going to be important to be able to understand the QCD physics that's going on in this collision if we want to be able to, for example, compute that cross-section. In addition, there's other types of interactions, which I should just mention. There can be not only collisions between the primary particles here, which are these two gluons, but some of the secondary particles could also collide and produce other types of radiation in the event. And so this goes by the name of multiple particle interactions. or underlying event. And actually, this type of thing, where you have more than one collision, is actually quite poorly understood. And maybe by the end of my lectures, I'll say something more about that. OK, so in order to understand this collision, one thing that you kind of see immediately is that there's a large range of distance scales, all the way from 10 to the minus 15 meters to 10 to the minus 18 meters. And you have to understand the physics as it evolves through that three orders of magnitude uh, change in scale. So. so if I say 10 to the minus 18 to 10 to the minus 15 in meters, that's in GV, about 1 GV to 1 TV. It's an energy scale we convert back and forth. So we're probing all these scales, and we need to understand them. OK, so what's inside this box? So it could be multiple different things. In particular, this is the short distance process where we actually can think about things just in terms of simple Feynman diagrams. So for example, in this process I've drawn here, where I've got a Higgs boson and various particles coming out of the box, it could be the following. I have a gluon come in. I have a top quark loop. I have another gluon come in. The Higgs boson likes to couple to mass, so it likes to couple to the, to the top quark. So the top quark is, of course, the heaviest fermion. So there's my Higgs boson. And then, in addition, I've got these other gluons here, which could come off of, for example, these legs. And so this would be a, a short distance process where two gluons come in, two gluons go out, plus a Higgs boson. So it's gluon, gluon to Higgs, gluon, gluon. 
Now, of course, we don't see the gluons, so we actually often, oftentimes we would say that this process is sort of proton, proton goes to Higgs plus two jets. That's how we would talk about it rather than, but the fundamental process is glue, glue goes to Higgs, glue, glue. And this dot little diagram that I've drawn here is just one example of a diagram. You'd have to actually add all the, all the possible diagrams together. Now, so this would be two jet production together with the Higgs. You could also have other things, and I'll talk about other things throughout my lecture. So the picture here is not the unique thing that can happen. There's lots of different things that can happen. Another thing that can happen is you could just have the gluons produce the Higgs boson without additional jets. That's even a simpler thing. Now there's no additional jets, so this would be CP to Higgs plus zero jets. And that's also possible. And actually experimentally what is done is that the number of jets is usually used as a tag both to control backgrounds and to enhance signals. And so you actually make separate measurements usually in the, with the different numbers of jets, zero jets, one jet, two jet. That's often how analyses are done. Now, this is producing a Higgs boson, but what's much more likely, because QCD is strongly interacting, is not to produce a Higgs boson at all. So another possibility would be to just take my picture and erase the Higgs boson and just have a process where my gluons, for example, were to produce two quark jets to a simple Feynman diagram like this one, quark and an anti-quark. PP goes to QQ bar, i.e. PP goes to two jets. And this is about 10 to the five times more likely than the Higgs boson process. cross-section is about 10 to the 5 times larger. Okay, so part of the game of searching for the Higgs boson is understanding backgrounds like, like jet processes that are much more common. Now, of course, what we hope lives inside the box is not just this QCD physics that I'm talking about, or this top quark, but rather some new physics. We hope there's some new heavy particle that couples to the Higgs boson, maybe it couples to gluons as well. And that by probing these interactions, we can, and looking at short distances, we can discover new particles or new types of interactions. We haven't really done that yet, but that's, that's what we're hoping for. So this gives you kind of an idea of some of the concepts that go into a QCD collision. And so it gives me a, now, I can give you a little bit of an outline of what we want to cover. So, Part of the interactions in this picture are perturbative, and some of the interactions in this picture are non-perturbative. And so we actually have to understand aspects of perturbative and non-perturbative QCD, and at least understand when the interactions are perturbative and when they're non-perturbative. Okay, so it turns out that the short distance problem part of the process is perturbative. The shower part of the process is perturbative. But this hadronization is definitely a non-perturbative part of the problem. And this incoming proton is definitely a non-perturbative part of the problem. And we need to understand when, how to distinguish that, because when it's perturbative, we can calculate it with perturbative QCD. When it's non-perturbative, we have to rely on other things, including lattice QCD, which you'll hear about this afternoon. OK, so that's one thing that we need to understand. There's also a kind of duality that we have to understand between quarks and gluons. So let me just say Q and G for quarks and gluons versus hadrons. And that's because whatever we measure is always a process that involves just hadrons. We measure something like PP goes to Higgs plus two jets. Okay, the Higgs is in the hadron, but we measure those photons. But what, if you look at the other parts of the process, it's two protons come in, a bunch of hadrons come out and collimated in these jets, but everything's a hadron. That's what we see in the detectors. And yet, we're gonna be doing calculations in terms of quarks and gluons, so we better understand to what extent our quark and gluon calculation actually applies to a process that involves hadrons. That's something to understand. It turns out 
that there are certain singularities in gauge theory that are actually very important to understanding what's going on in this picture, called soft and collinear singularities. So that's another thing we'll study. We're going to have to study these jets, because that's how we see quarks and gluons. And there's this shower of radiation that produced the jet, and we better understand that. Add that to the list. And then, finally, there's a question of how am I even going to possibly compute a process that looks this complicated? There's lots of different things that are going on. How can I uh, deal with it? And the way that we're going to deal with it is by using a process known as factorization. That basically means that we're going to deal with the different parts of this problem one at a time, and we see that we can actually put them together in a meaningful way. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. OK, so that's kind of the program of what I want to talk about. Not really a detailed outline, but at least a conceptual outline. And so I'll start out by just giving you a review of QCD itself, and then we'll go uh, slowly into the, some of these details throughout the coming lectures. OK, so let's start with a review of QCD. So QCD is an SU3 gauge theory. You already heard about the standard model. It's part of the standard model. The number of colors, NC, three. So if I ever write NC, I, I really mean three, but NC is a shorthand for that. And as a gauge theory, it has a coupling to the field strength tensor for the gluons, as well as a coupling with the quarks. Alpha and beta here are some color indices. A is also a color index. I is some flavor index. And so here I would sum over I is up, down, strange, charm, bottom, top. Include all those quarks. They all couple to universally to the gluons. There's a covariant derivative here. And then there's also a gauge fixing term. A few words about. And that's the Lagrangian we'll be studying. So it's a very simple theory, and it describes lots of different phenomena. Okay. So what are these various things, just to establish some notation? So the field strength involves the gluon field. So it's an anti-symmetric combination of the derivative and the gauge field. And then because the theory is non-abelian, there's yet another term. structure constants, two gluon fields. So this last term is what makes QCD different than QED, what may, comes about because it's not abelian. And if you think about what that does when you square the G, it means there's interactions between the gluons themselves, not just with gluons with the quarks, as there would be in QED, but also between, between the gluons. OK, so we have the quark field of the gluons. Those are kind of the fundamental objects that we want to think about the field theory built in terms of. How many of them are there? Well, here there's three, and here there's eight. So this is what you call a fundamental representation of the gauge theory, and this is what you call the adjoint representation. Okay. There's the, just to establish my sign convention for G, let me write down the co covariant derivative. That. And this ge these generators here satisfy, the, if we go define the structure constants as the commutator of the generators, we also have that identity. So in the lecture notes that I posted, I provided you with a lot more information about QCD. Actually, I fit it all, I tried to fit it all in one page, sort of a lightning introduction to QCD. So you can refer to that for more information. But nevertheless, let me give you a, a few of the interactions that we have. So we have the interactions between quarks and gluons, and we express that as a Feynman rule. Looks like that. And then we have interactions between gluons and gluons. 
So here it depends on the momenta. So if I take three incoming momenta, then the sum of these momenta is zero. Let's call it P1, P2, P3. And I can call the indices likewise mu1 for the vector index and A for the color, mu2 and B, mu3 and C. And then this interaction through the, this g mu squared term, because of the presence of this inside g mu, we get an interaction between three gluons like that. We just have to dot up the indices and contract them in some way into various objects that are available to us. Derive the Feynman rule from the Lagrangian. And so there's a term like this where two of the gluons are contracted and then one of them's contracted with a derivative that turns into some momenta. And then there's cyclic permutations of this where one goes to two, goes to three, goes to one, or one goes to three, goes to two, goes to one. So that's a little bit more messy, but that's the three gluon Feynman rule. And then there's also a term involving four gluons that we would get from squaring this one, and I leave that as an exercise for you, or you can look it up in some book. So that's the type of interactions we have. So when you talk about Q QED, you think about the charge. And so a natural question to ask is, what's the analog of charge in QCD? In QED, it would just be the electromagnetic charge. Electrons are minus one. Protons are plus one. The quarks are two-thirds or minus a third. That's charge. In QCD, it's a little more complicated because it's non-abelian. But there's still a notion of charge, meaning how important are, the are these various couplings. And the charges are given by, in some sense, these matrices which live in this color space. But what actually is, that's not a number, that's an object with some indices. So that, that doesn't really naturally correspond to the same notion that we have as a, of an electromagnetic charge. So a better way of thinking about charge and of the way that it comes out when you do calculations is as follows. So you're always gonna get pairs of these objects. So if I take two of these objects, then and I contract them together, that actually squares to the identity if I sum over A. And the coefficient here is what's called the quadratic Casimir of the fundamental representation, and it's just a number, four thirds. And so this is the way that two fermions would, this is like a, a charge for the fermions in QCD. It's kind of, it's as close as we can get to a sort of saying we have a quark color charge. When I have quarks interacting, I'm gonna get these factors of CF, which are four thirds, and that's how I can think of as a charge. And if I have gluons interacting, I'm gonna get products of these Fs, and if I take two Fs, then I also have an identity here, where this contracts to the adjoint Casimir and identity operator as well, delta AB, and the CA is three. Now, if you can see the very bottom of the board, let me write it here. And so that's the gluon color charge. Okay, so we have CA is three, let me write it at the top, and CF is four thirds. And you can see that there's roughly a factor of two between them. So gluons are coupling twice as strongly as a quark is coupling, and that's kind of the physical notion that I want you to take out of that. Okay, so that's kind of some of the basics. Let's come back over here and talk about this term that I didn't say anything about yet, this gauge fixing term, just by, for, by way of having a complete discussion. So when we think about the physical degrees of freedom for a gluon, there's two of them, okay? But when we write down the field for the gluon, we've given it an index nu that runs from one to four, or zero, one, two, three. And that means there's a redundancy. There's a gauge uh, redundancy in our description. And really, when we think about formulating the quantum field theory as a path integral, where we integrate over the space of fields, 
we shouldn't be doing an integral over redundant variables. So you want to think of integrating over the space of fields just as integrating over the sort of a gauge invariant set of degrees of freedom that would just correspond to those two physical polarizations. But that's not the gauge field, because the gauge field has redundancy in it. And when you go through it, if you think about instead integrating over sort of a more, more degrees of freedom, you're going to have to introduce some kind of delta function to project you onto a gauge invariant set of degrees of freedom. And when you go through that procedure, which I don't want to explain in a lot of detail, but if you go through that procedure and you do what's called the fedeyev popoff analysis, it ends up adding an extra term to the Lagrangian that fixes the gauge. And there's different ways of doing it. One way of doing it is what's called covariant gauge. If you want to read more about it, look up the day of Popoff. But it's the way we project from a gauge invariant set of degrees of freedom down to integrating over more degrees of freedom with some gauge fixing. And that induces an ex extra terms in the Lagrangian. So in this case, for a covariant gauge, we've added a, a gauge fixing term like this. And then when we do the change of variables that that entails, where we switch variables from our gauge invariant degrees of freedom to our, gauge, to our full gauge field, that change of variables always involves a Jacobian. In, QCD, in QED, the Jacobian is kind of trivial and it doesn't play any role. But in QCD, the Jacobian also introduces, also is non-trivial and has to be taken into account. And the way that we take that into account is by introducing some fields called ghost fields. ghost. It's a scalar field, but it has Fermi statistics, so it's anti-commuting. That's why we call it a ghost. And it's also an adjoint, as, it, as indicated by this capital letter A. Okay, so these are the extra terms that are induced by the process of gauge fixing, or by the process of wanting to do the path integral or do our Feynman diagrams using the full gauge field, but knowing in, in the back of our minds that there's really a gauge, that there's a gauge redundancy in doing the, doing, setting things up that way. And you actually need these terms if you want to tr construct the propagator of the theory. If you want to construct the gluon propagator and you just start with this term here, you can't invert it to get the gluon propagator. But after you include these gauge fixing terms, then you can invert it and you can and get the gluon propagator. Okay, so for our discussion, we're going to stick with Feynman gauge. Where C is just equal to 1. And if you invert the propagator for C equals 1, then the gauge propagator to go from A mu to B nu, just minus I, B mu nu, delta AB, and then there's some momentum. We have a very simple propagator, which is the same as what you would call the Feynman gauge propagator in QED. OK, so that's some of the details of understanding, or some of the basics of understanding the QCD Lagrangian. If you have a question, please just raise your hand or shout out, I have a question. That's perfectly allowed. OK, so one other key concept about QCD is how it behaves at different distance scales. And we've already seen a hint that something is going to happen because at some distance scales, there's non-perturbative physics happening related to this hadronization. And at some distance scales, I told you the physics is perturbative. And the way that we think about that, or the easiest way to understand what's going on, is by understanding that in QCD, the coupling strength depends on distance. And this goes by the name of what's called the running coupling. So, there's a resolution associated to the scale we're probing. 
And that's very important in QCD. So in this process over here, we're studying three different orders of magnitude of resolution scale. So if I talk about the strong coupling alpha s, which is just the coupling in the Lagrangian g squared over 4 pi, in QCD, that's a function of distance scale. It changes value as I change the resolution that I'm probing. That's not totally surprising, perhaps, because what is this, cu this coupling, or what is this coupling? Well, it's some parameter in my quantum field theory. And any time I have a parameter in the quantum field theory, it goes through a process of what's called renormalization, meaning I have to define that parameter uh, because the field theory is divergent. There's going to be some ultraviolet divergences I need to absorb in that parameter. And even after I've absorbed those ultraviolet divergences, I still have some ambiguity as to exactly how I define, if you like, the finite contributions. So there's always some sort of definition that's inherent in the parameters of the quantum field theory, and you've got to pick something. That's called picking a renormalization scheme for the parameters of your quantum field theory. So this is a parameter of the quantum field theory, and we need to pick a renormalization scheme. And the scheme that everybody uses is what's called the MS-bar renormalization scheme. And when I pick that renormalization scheme, there's actually, this is a one-parameter family of renormalization schemes that depends on the resolution. So you, if you like, there's a scheme parameter that comes along with my definition, and that's what this mu is. But we'll see that it's actually related to the, that it gets related to the physics of what's happening in the process. It's not just an artifact of some definition. Okay, so uh, how do divergences show up when I start doing Feynman diagrams? Well, if I just start calculating loop diagrams in the quantum field theory, there's going to be divergences. So if I calculate a gluon self-energy contribution like that, or a quark contribution to the two, gluon two-point function, these di diagrams have ultraviolet divergences, and they're going to uh, be related to renormalizing the coupling. And actually, in QCD, when you start going through this, because of the gauge symmetry, you can't just think about two-point functions like you think about in, in QED, you also have to think about three-point functions. So things are a little more complicated. But when I actually go through the renormalization of the theory, I, I renormalize this coupling, and I get uh, an equation called the beta function equation that just tells me how it, it uh, evolves with the scale mu. And I write that as a differential equation with some coefficients. The diagrams that I'm computing there have more factors of the, of the strong coupling, so it comes in squared. And the divergences tell me that that mixes back, if you like, into the definition of my strong coupling. There's a counter term that would be disproportional to a single power of the coupling, and I'm involved in renormalizing these diagrams. I need some counter terms. This, like this, renormalize the diagrams. So this is the beta function. This beta naught, which I've indicated as a function of an f, gets a piece from the non-abelian interactions, a piece from the gluons, and that involves this Casimir CA. And then it gets a piece from the fermions, and that involves the number of fermions. So there's NF, NF fermions, which could be six. For example, if I include all the way up to the top quark, from the up quark to the top quark. Okay, so this is just a number. And this equation tells me that the coupling changes with resolution scale mu. So I can solve this differential equation. To solve a differential equation, you need to put in some boundary conditions. There's two different ways I can put in boundary conditions here. One way I could put in boundary conditions is to tell you the coupling at some scale. So if I told you the coupling at one scale and I ask, using this evolution equation, what's the coupling at another scale, 
and I can write down the solution for you. There it is. And if I look at this uh, equation here and I see what the coupling's doing, it's increasing as I lower the resolution. Let me draw a picture. This beta naught is positive. The overall beta function, this whole term here, is negative, and that's the hallmark of QCD. It's what's different about QCD than QED. In QED, you'd only have this term, so the whole thing would be positive. <coughs> so as a function of this resolution scale, the coupling is changing, and it actually is changing quite quickly. So there's a plot of the coupling. So just to give you an example of sort of how quickly, the B quark mass is around 5 GV. And if I look at the B quark mass, the coupling is about 0.22. And then if I go up to the Z boson mass, which I'll fit in over here, which is 90 GV, with another relevant scale, the coupling is changed by a factor of two. Okay, so the, the amount, the strength of my interactions can change by factors of two. So it's obviously important to get this, this resolution scale right if you want to make calculations, if you want to get them right even at the factor of two level. And so if you're down here in this region, which is the high energy region on this tail, that's what we call the perturbative region. So this is perturbative QCD, the subject of these lectures. And then there's non-perturbative QCD, because you see the coupling is blowing up, and there's a region of the coupling where it gets large. And that's the subject of the lattice QCD lectures in some sense. And this is the realm in which confinement occurs. Okay, So confinement, where the quarks and gluons are confined to hadrons, have, for example, baryons, which are triplets of quarks, or mesons, which are QQ bar pairs. That's happening in this region where the strong coupling is so strong that it doesn't let the quarks fly apart from each other, and it binds them into these bags of had which we call hadrons. So that happens at strong coupling. And then there's this other region here of weak coupling. And in fact, if you continue this plot out all the way over here, out to infinity, the coupling goes to zero. So alpha s as mu goes to infinity is equal zero. And that's kind of strange if you think about it, because that's saying at very, very short distances, the quarks are free. They're confined at long distances, which is when they hit the edges of the, of the hadron, if you like. But they're free at very, very short distances. And that's the idea of what's called asymptotic freedom. Which, of course, won a Nobel Prize for QCD. Well, it's a gross and well check. So as indicated in this picture, there's kind of a finite value here where the coupling it blows up. And another way of seeing that is that, that I can write this solution to the beta function equation in an alternate form, defining a quantity lambda QCD, which is exactly the quantity, the, the value where that coupling blows up. So if you stick this equation into the, in here, you'll see it's a solution. And in this form, I've introduced the dimension one parameter, okay, which is the value where the coupling blows up. And that allows me to say in numbers, you know, where is confinement happening? It's happening at this order of this lambda QCD. And because I can relate it to measurements of the coupling, I can actually extract values for this lambda QCD, which is about 300 MeV. The confinement is happening down at this 1 GeV, 300 MeV range. And that's exactly the range corresponding to this 10 to the minus 15 meters in the, pit, in the picture over here. <coughs> 
And then as I go up, you know, three orders of magnitude this way, I get into the regime where QCD is very perturbative, and that justifies what I told you before. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so that's kind of an introduction to some of the basics of QCD, this idea that the coupling depends on a resolution scale. We gotta figure out what the right resolution scale is when we do a calculation. This is, this is an important concept. So how does it show up if we do, we do a calculation, how does this idea of the resolution scale going to show up? So when we calculate some physical cross-section, that physical cross-section is going to involve some scales. So I'm going to do some calculation. It's going to involve this coupling constant. It's going to involve some dimensionful parameters. Let me just say the parameter is called S. And what's going to happen when you do that calculation is you're going to get factors of logs of mu over s together with the coupling constant. And so how do you pick your mu? Well, you can see that if you were to pick mu much different than this s, you'd have this extra logarithm, and that logarithm can start to get large. So you don't want this logarithm to be too large. And so the way that you avoid this logarithm being too large is by picking mu to be of order s. It doesn't have to be exactly s, could be s over 2, 2s, around s, but not 100s. That would be a bad choice. And so this is the way in which physical scales s that show up in your calculation end up guiding you as to how to pick the, the resolution scale. And this is kind of very simplistic in the sense that there's only one s here, but really what happens in a more complicated process like this one over here is that there's multiple s parameters. And some of the choices S are going to be in this non-perturbative region, and then I have to use some strong coupling methods. Or they're going to be in different perturbative regions. Even, even this 10 to the minus 18 down to, say, 10 to the minus 16 is all perturbative, but different choices of the coupling are relevant. And that's because different parts of the, this, this have different physical processes going on sensitive to different distance scales, and different types of logarithms are showing up. And so that's how the physics of scales that are in the problem that you're calculating get related to this resolution scale through logarithms. Add. There's more than one scale. Phi. More than one relevant coupling. More than one relevant scale for the coupling. One relevant scale. OK, so there's one other aspect of the equation over here that I didn't go into which is yet, which is this superscript NF. And the reason that there's a superscript NF is because whether or not you include this diagram depends on the mass of the fermion. And the fermions actually have a wide range of masses, all the way from 170 GeV down to 1 GeV for the, or down to tens of GeV for the up quark, 170 GeV for the top quark. And whether I include this diagram depends on what scale I'm probing. And that's because there's a concept known as decoupling. And heavy particles decouple. When we use the language of integrating something out or removing something from the theory, the reason that we're using that language is oftentimes because of this fact that heavy particles decouple at low energy. And the same is true for the calculations involving this coupling. And so what that means is that if I say, for example, I'm at the, the top quark mass scale, above the top quark mass scale here, I would want to use the coupling alpha 6 with all six quarks active. And then below that mass of that cup, below that mass scale M top, I want to switch to thinking about just five flavors. And the top is removed from the theory. So I no longer consider the top loop. 
So here I have the top loop. Here I have no top loop. So if this concept is not too familiar to you, there's actually a homework problem. And I've got made, that, made up that homework problem in what I, what's an online course on effective field theory that I teach. And I, in my lecture notes, you'll see a link. And if you click on that link, you can get into the course for free. And in chapter four, there's a problem on heavy particle decoupling. And it's a very nice problem because it, the computer grades it. So you go through the problem and you find out immediately whether you're right or wrong. And you can see the solution, et cetera. So you don't, you don't even need me to tell you the answer. The computer will do it. OK, so homework problem related to this if you want to learn more about it. OK. So I want to come back to the picture that I've kept on the board here and talk a little bit about this concept of factorization that I briefly mentioned to you. So this factorization is really at the heart of everything we do in collider physics. And so it's worth talking about it now, as well as perhaps talking about it in more detail later on. Because it's kind of an overarching framework for understanding how we do calculations involving collisions like that one. So the basic idea here is what I said, that you want to divide the process of the calculation into pieces. And so if I want to calculate some differential cross-section for this process over here, how do I divide it into pieces? Well, the type of pieces that I would divide it in are associated to the distance scales in the problem. So it's kind of related to this concept of decoupling, that the different parts of the problem can be dealt with independently. So one part of the problem is that I'm colliding gluons, but those gluons come from the protons. So I have to take the gluons out of the protons, and there's some probability that I find a, a given gluon in the proton. And so that's part of the problem. The next part of the problem is that short distance part of the problem, where we had our orange box. And in the orange box, we're going to do some calculation involving quarks and gluons, like gluon gluon goes to Higgs, or gluon gluon goes to Higgs glue glue depending on what we're interested in, et cetera. So we're going to do some calculation with Feynman diagrams. And that's going to be part of, part of putting things together. So that takes us from, if you like, that takes us from this, these protons looking inside the box. But then there's also what happens after the collision. So we need some probabilities for the gluons to produce jets, quarks and gluons. So this is kind of schematically what factorization means. It means that I can deal with those different parts of the problem that are at different distance scales as kind of different probabilities that I multiply together to get a total probability or a total cross-section. This is kind of one uh, important idea. Another important, which is factorization, another important idea is the idea of using what's called inclusive quantities. So the question is, what do I actually measure? And it's probably not too interesting to measure the four momentum or the energy of every single particle in the collision. That's like too much information. You want to measure something more aggregate, where you sum particles together. And that's what's meant by the word inclusive here. And this is not only something that's sort of making things more feasible to think about. It's actually theoretically something that helps to an enormous extent. So some of the processes we'll talk about in these lectures are a collision of electron-positron to produce x. By x, I mean any hadrons, anything at all, but, but hadrons. Another process, which we'll talk about, is deep inelastic scattering, 
CIS, where I have electron-proton collision, and again, I produce anything. And then, just to touch base with my picture over there, let me give you a third example where I'll go into more detail. We'll come back to these other two. So let's look at Higgs production. And again, I'm going to look at it as proton, proton goes to Higgs plus anything, Higgs plus x. Okay? And the x can be a sum over all the hadrons, any hadrons. Or if I like this language of jets, it could be, and I've divided things up that way, it could be zero jet, one jet, two jet, all the, any number of jets. Okay, don't put any restrictions. And in that case, I can actually tell you explicitly what the right formula is to put the pieces together. I want to do this to emphasize a few points, but so what's the formula? Well, there's some part of the problem that's related to picking the, pro the gluon out of the proton, and that's this F function. And there's two of them, so there's two Fs. And then there's a part of the problem that's related to the, the orange box, like the short distance process of gluon, gluon goes to Higgs plus any number of quarks and gluons. Let me put that one in an orange box. And then there's what happens in the final state, and I'm just going to put one there. Okay, so this formula is not enormously complicated. I can write it down in one line. Let me describe to you a few, few of the ingredients that are going in here. This is what's called a parton distribution function. And it's a probability, you can think of it like a probability distribution. So Fg, the probability distribution for picking a gluon out of my proton with some momentum related to this x, and x is actually a momentum fraction. Find a gluon in the proton, where it carries a momentum, a fraction of the momentum of the total proton momenta, which is given by this dimensionless parameter, dimensionless parameter x. XA from that one. This here we just calculate in perturbation theory. It's going to depend on the incoming momentum of those gluons, so it's going to depend on XA and XB. I'm not measuring anything in the final state, so there's no additional variables there. And of course, it could depend on the Higgs boson mass, so we'll put that in as well. The thing where I've made things simpler for myself is that I didn't measure anything about the final state, so I just put one there. And intuitively, what's happening is that quantum field theory is, like any good theory, unitary. That means probabilities are adding to one. The chance of something happening, if you add up all the somethings, is one. And that's what we've done here. When we look at Higgs production and we don't care about what's in the final state, then I'm adding up all the possibilities, and I can use unitarity, and that's just telling me that the sum of those probabilities are adding to one, and that's why I have a one here. One, sum of all probabilities of various things happening. The final state. So by making things more inclusive, you're making them simpler because you don't care about lots of variables because of things like this, the sum of probabilities equal one. So that means we're not sensitive to any of the dynamics of what, how many jets did we produce, how did those jets get produced, how wide is the jet, how much energy does it have. None of that matters if I don't measure it. Now, that, that's nice in a theory land, but in experiment, we are forced to make measurements of more than just inclusive cross-sections. So experimentally, we're not, all, we're not summing freely over every possibility. There's going to be some experimental cuts. Sometimes we want to divide things up into different amount, numbers of jets, like I told you. Okay? So there's reasons why we don't want to make the measurements this way. 
And that reintroduces some of the complications related to the final state. So practical considerations say that we have to do more than this. So the sum over the i is incomplete, like 2, 2. Distinguishing the jets, make measurements on the jets, for example, to eliminate backgrounds or understand backgrounds. Or if we want to understand efficiencies in an experiment, then we actually need more exclusive events. So there's many different experimental reasons and experiment guides what we have to calculate why we actually don't freely sum over this i. But this idea is still there that if I sum over things, it's making things simpler. That idea is correct. So even when I'm talking about jets, I'm not going to talk about every single particle in the jet. I'm only going to talk about a few aggregate things. So if I'm thinking about a jet, so here's a jet. What kind of things what might I think about? Well, I might think about the full four vector of all the particles in the jet, where PJ just sums over all the constituents of the jet. And I don't distinguish the constituents, but I just sum over them. And that's still in this idea of making things simpler by making them more inclusive. That's still in that realm. Okay? It's, it's not a complete sum like it was over there, but it's still making things simpler by summing over particles. And this, this idea we'll, we'll exploit in our discussion of jets. OK. So I want to come back now and talk about this guy in more detail, go through some more calculations. So E plus E minus, why are we starting with E plus E minus? Well, you saw that PP was complicated and had lots of things going on. <clears throat> so we want to start with something simpler. So let's start with something that just has very simple physics in the initial state, electron-positron colliding. And then we'll be able to study in more detail what's going on in the final state. Okay, we're not going to make any. We'll, we'll think about various different possibilities for the final state here, including no restrictions at all. If we start calculating this at a quark level, we have a process where E plus E minus annihilate to a virtual photon, and then that virtual photon produces a QQ bar pair, for example. Okay, so that's a Feynman diagram. Or it could produce a QQ bar pair in a gluon or other things. Right? We're only going to be thinking about the strong interactions here, so we'll always work to lowest order in the electromagnetic interactions. At tree level, the type of Feynman diagram that you would compute would be electron-positron, virtual photon, QQ bar pair. And this is just the lowest order diagram. And then you take that diagram, square it, sum over spins, you do your usual Feynman diagram, Feynman rule uh, analysis. And if you go through that, you get a cross section. It's the following. This is the electromagnetic coupling, not the strong coupling, so I put a subscript EM on it. The cross section has dimension minus two, so there's a one over Q squared, where Q is the momentum of this virtual photon. And then the number of colors comes in because I'm not, if I just sum over freely over all possible quarks, then there's three of them, so I have to account for that. And then the sum of electric charges comes in because I care about how, what the electric charge is of the quarks. And the electric charge is going to be 2 thirds or 1 minus a third, depending on whether it's up type or down type. Right? And this is a classic quantity, actually, that people, that people study. And the reason is that it's actually sensitive to charges. And this idea of decoupling comes in as well. Because when I sum over these charges, I should only sum over the active quarks. 
if my collision energy is not, so, and it's not great enough to, for example, produce top quarks, then I shouldn't sum over the top quarks in this sum over all the possible quark flavors. So this is a, a sum over active quarks, where active basically means that the mass is smaller than the Q squared I'm probing. So I should have enough energy to produce that particle. We have produced two of them, so there's a factor of four. So what happens with this observable, if you look at it, is if you look at thresholds, where you start to produce the charm quarks and start to produce the bottom quarks, then it's going to jump, because all of a sudden you're including an extra term in the sum. And experimentally, we see those jumps. And that's a nice way of probing for the existence of those quarks. OK. And usually, you do that with something called the R ratio, where you normalize this cross-section to E plus E minus. And I'm not going to go too much into the phenomenology there. But that's an interesting probe for the quark, for the existence of quarks. Even though we don't see them, the fundamental nature of these quarks, we can see these jumps due to their electromagnetic charges, and it agrees. Calculations agree with data in a way that I'll explain by the end of this topic. OK, so this is the lowest order process. What if I, when I add corrections to that? So at first order in the corrections, I go to order alpha s. So I have my tree level process, and now I start correcting it. So I could have an extra gluon forming a loop like that. I could have a wave function normalization diagram like that. Or I could have gluons that are just emitted. And these are the type of diagrams that I would have to sum and square if I want to calculate the process at order alpha. We call these ones here virtual diagrams. And we call these ones here real emission diagrams. Real for short. They're both giving real contributions to the cross section. This is the, the names. And so we can say that the cross-section is given by the tree-level cross-section with corrections. And let me normalize the corrections to the tree-level. And I'll use sigma v for virtual and sigma r for real. The reason I included this diagram is that the virtual diagrams interfere with this diagram to give something that's order alpha. Alpha is two fa factors of g. These diagrams already have two factors of g. So it's these guys times this guy, not these guys squared that contribute to this. And in the real, it's order g, so it's these guys squaring with, with themselves. And that's giving the contribution that's order g squared to the sigma r here. <coughs> OK, so we have to do this calculation. The reason I want to talk about this calculation is it's actually going to be divergent. And it's going to diverge in a way that's different than just this UV denormalization that we had to deal with with the strong coupling. And we're going to have to understand how to deal with those divergences. And those divergences are actually going to teach us something about the physics of the collision. So these are infrared divergences as opposed to ultraviolet divergences. And they're going to teach us something about the physics that's going on in, in collisions. So that's where we're going with this. So let's study the real ones first. Start with the real. So how do I do a calculation for the real? Well. I would have a phase space integral to do over three body final state phase space. And then I'd take my amplitude for the real process and I'd square it. And that's how I do the calculation. So let me write this out. So there's three particles in the final state. For each particle, I integrate over its three momentum. It's an on shell particle. There's a factor of energy downstairs in the phase space measure. And there's a momentum conserving delta function that says that the total momentum Q that comes from the, the virtual photon here is equal to the sum of the P1, P2, P3 of the final state particles. So let me call this 1, 2, 3, 3. P1, P, yeah. Yeah, I'm not. In the end, I, I can sum them, but 
really what I mean by this is just sum and square. So when I actually interfere them, I'm not going to interfere this one with this one. So it's just a shorthand notation, if you like. I could have written this. That makes you happier. Good question, though. OK, so I have this phase space factor, and then I have And I have the diagram squared for the real. Okay, so as I said, the p squared, p1 squared, p2 squared, and p3 squared, those are 0. And so this pi0 is really just the magnitude of pi vector. Okay, they're all on shell. All right, so this is the calculation. I just have to do it. I'm not going to go through all the details, but I'm going to go through some of them, because some of them are important, and some of them are less so. So if I work in the center of mass frame, then the Q vector just has energy and doesn't have any three vector. So that's a convenient thing to do. And what are a convenient set of variables for dealing with this? Well, some of the variables are angles that I can do. Some of the variables I can do with this delta function. What are the variables that I want to leave left over? It turns out it's convenient to talk about energy fractions, which are these vectors, P1, P2, P3, dotted into Q and then normalized to make a dimensionless object. So in the frame we're in, this is a 2 over Q, and then it's PI0. So it's like a dimensionless version of energies. And it turns out that these x's are bounded between 0 and 1 when I put that factor of 2 in. Okay, And that's because the maximum energy is basically Q over 2 because I'm always going to have some particle going this way and some particle going that way, so if, and they have to balance the three momentum. So if the three momentum is balanced of just, to say, two particles going back to back, they each carry half the energy, and that's why this factor of two is there. OK, so these are a nice set of variables. If I look at energy conservation in terms of these variables, it says that x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to two. Some of them is 2. One way of saturating that would be to have two of them equal to 1 and the other one 0, but there's more complicated possibilities as well. So this is a little bit of kinematics. And I want to do a, one other thing that's going to be useful in a sack. So the fact that these p squareds are equal to 0 also give me constraints between other Lorentz invariants. So let me work one of them out just because it'll be useful in a few minutes. So p1 squared equals 0 also says that q minus p2 minus p3 squared is equal to 0. And if I square this out, well, q squared is just capital Q squared. p2 squared is 0, p3 squared is 0, and then I get the various dot products. Some of those dot products are related to x's, and then there's one that's not, just p2 dot p3. But since this is 0, I can solve for p2 dot p3 in terms of the other ones. So if I do that, I get 2 p2 dot p3 equal to q squared x2 plus x3 minus 1. And because of this condition here, I can also write that in terms of x1. q squared 1 minus x1. <coughs> or I could alternatively just decompose this dot product of two four vectors, massless four vectors, in terms of things like energies and angles. And if I were to do that, I would say it's 2 e2 dot times e3, and then 1 minus cosine of the angle theta 2, 3 between the two particles. So if I have particle 2 and 3, theta 2, 3 is the angle, physical angle between those four vector momenta. OK, so those are just different ways of writing the same thing. But I wanted to do that because it's going to be useful in a few minutes. OK, so let me write down the answer in terms of these x variables for this phase space integral. We'll see these singularities that I was talking about up here. So what do we get? So we get dx1, dx2, dx3, all bounded 0 to 1. There's a delta function, because I said they're not independent, they have to add up to 2. And then there's a matrix element that I get from summing and squaring here. 
and then just rewriting things in terms of the x's. And I can write everything in terms of just two of them, so let me write it in terms of x1 and x2. Leave a little space, because I'll add something here in a minute. So this is what the answer looks like. And you see is that x1 goes to 1 or x2 goes to 1, it diverges. So it has IR divergences. So what is the physical region that these IR divergences are coming from? This is the soft and collinear limits that I mentioned to you. So when the gluon momentum P3 goes to 0, we have a soft gluon. This is what's called a soft limit. And in this limit, x3 goes to 0. But if x3 goes to 0 and the sum of them have to add to 2 and they're bounded between 0 and 1, this means that both x1 and x2 go to 1. And if x1 and x2 go to 1, there's a divergence. So there's a, well, there's two divergences. So there's divergences in this soft limit. So that's one region where the divergences come from. Another region where the divergences come from is what are called collinear limits. So if P3 goes to P1, that means the gluon is collinear to the quark. And if P3 goes to P2, then the gluon would be collinear to, say, the antiquark, Q bar. In this limit, P1 dot P3 would go to 0, because p1 squared is 0 and p3 squared is 0. So if, the, if they go equal to each other, that's 0. Likewise here, go to 0. <coughs> and if you look at this formula that I wrote for you, if p2 dot p3 goes to 0, that means that x1 has to go to 1. That's why I wrote this formula. So p2 and p3 being 0 means x1 goes to 1. And there's a divergence in the 1 minus x1. And likewise, just by sort of symmetry, this would be x2 goes to 1. And again, there'd be a divergence. If you think about this in terms of the angle, which is also why I wrote this formula, and you think about this going to 0, it's like the angle going to 0. So this is theta 2, 3 goes to 0. And that's kind of a, more physically what you think about as the particles going collinear, because now the particles 2 and 3 or have zero angle between them. And then likewise here, this is theta 1, 3 goes to 0. So the IR divergences in this problem are coming from these what are called collinear and soft limits of the particles. And we can draw a nice picture for that. Back over here, somehow all my cloths ended up on this side. We can draw a nice picture for that in this phase space with these dimensionless variables. And what we find when we look at the infrared divergences is they happen at edges of phase space. So here's a box in x1, x2 space where things are bounded between 0 and 1. This constraint about x3, well, x3 is a redundant variable, but x3 would be 0 this is sort of the x3 axis. This is where x3 is equal to 1, and that's the maximum of the x3. So there's a line in here. And they're in this, in this triangle. That's the allowed phase space. Okay, So this is the limit of x3 going 0 up in this corner. And then the limits of the x's going to 1 are these upper edges. And that's where the singularities occur. So if I were to draw kind of the region which is singular, it's kind of like this, and then this corner, and then this edge. So this is the region where the IR singularities are occurring. On this line here, it's when P1 and P3 were parallel, or collinear. This one is P2 parallel to P3. And then in this corner is when P3 became soft. So we have IR singularities on the edges of phase space. And that's a generic feature, even in higher dimensions, that the divergences are happening on the edges of phase space. So we need to regulate it. 
just like we regulate ultraviolet divergences, we need to regulate these divergences as well. So how are we going to do that? So we have to come back to our phase-based calculation, and we have to do something more intelligent, because it wasn't regulated over here. And the nice thing to do that doesn't spoil any symmetries is actually to use dimensional regularization, even for ultraviolet divergences. So we go back to our integral over here. Instead of using 3, we use d minus 1. And instead of using 4 here, we use d, where d is 4 minus 2 epsilon. And that's dimensional regularization. It can be used for phase space integrals as well as for virtual integrals. So we trace through what happens when I do that. And if I do the phase space with those extra factors, it regulates things, and I get extra factors in here that regulate the divergences as x1 and x2 goes to 0. And then just for completeness, if I do the matrix element in dimensional regularization, there's also an extra factor up there. OK, so I can use dimensional regularization to regulate the divergences. And now I have an integral that I can do when I keep this epsilon as a parameter. And actually, it's epsilon less than 0 that's regulating infrared divergences. OK, so that will allow me to write down an answer in a few minutes, which I will do. So we can get a well-defined meaning of sort of these singular regions. Uh, so what are the, what's going on in these singular regions? What's going on in these singular regions is that I'm no longer resolving the differences between P2 and P3. If both particles are collimated, I can't tell that di the difference. And so that's exactly kind of the region in, in this edge here where it's not behaving like three distinguishable particles, but actually just like more like just two particles. So if you think about what's going on in, say, this situation here where two is parallel to three, it's like you have, instead of three jet event with quark, quark, gluon, where each of them could be thought of as producing its own jet in the end, it's actually two jet event. Okay? So all along the edge here is actually a region of the problem where you shouldn't be thinking about the three partons as two jets, I mean as three jets, but they're only giving two jets. And then everywhere else in the problem where you're away from the edges is where you should really think about the partons as being distinguishable. And then you have three jets. Each parton will evolve into its own jet. So these singular re regions are important also for distinguishing jets. And this is something we'll talk more about next time. But OK, so we've regulated the divergences with this epsilon. But there's still 1 over epsilon poles that are going to show up. And how do the, what's going on with those 1 over epsilon poles? Well, it turns out that those 1 over epsilon poles cancel against the real, the real graphs that have those 1 over epsilon poles cancel against virtual diagrams. In exactly these limits where it's looking back like two jets, that's the limit of phase space where the virtual diagrams are also contributing. They only have two final state particles. So there's cancellations between the real Which we've just talked about, and the virtual, or the 1 over epsilon, which are infrared divergences here. This is related to something that's called the KLN theorem in quantum field theory, that if you sum over degenerate states, then, there's, then the infrared divergences are canceling. And here we're summing, when in these limits, what's happening is that the states are becoming degenerate, indistinguishable. So we can go through an analysis, and since my time is kind of short, I may just not go through it in detail, but we can go through an analysis of the loop diagrams, just like we did in the phase space. And I can use the same infrared regulator for these loop diagrams. So for example, in this loop diagram here, I can use dimensional regularization. If I look at the most singular part of this loop diagram, it would come from when in the numerator, I don't have any factors of k, and I just have all the factors of k in the denominator. So this is k, k, k minus p2, and this is k plus p1. If I look at the soft limit of this loop diagram, k goes to 0, then it's behaving like ddk dot p2, 
or k squared. Yeah. Yeah, so in the numerator, there's going to be lots of different terms. After doing the sum over the, the spins and the trace, you're going to get various dot products of momentum. There can be factors up there with k's as well. But the term that's got the most infrared singularities is the term that just involves the external momentum and not any k's. So I'm just throwing that factor in as one possible thing that can happen in the numerator. But in general, there'll be other things and there'll be some prefactor here that I'm suppressing. So there'll be order k terms that I'm not writing down. Thanks for making me slow down and say that. So if I study this loop integral in the soft limit, it's going to have IR divergences. And you can already kind of see that from this, from this, just this result, because there's four factors of k downstairs. So as k goes to zero, there's four k's upstairs, four k's downstairs. They're going to need the dimensional regularization to regulate the infrared singularity. And also the collinear limit, where k would go parallel to p1, or k goes parallel to p2, there's going to be infrared singularities as well. So there's a, a direct analog of the singularities we saw in the real emission diagrams and singularities that are in the virtual diagrams. Okay, so let me just quote for you. In the notes, I go into a little more detail, and I write out this loop integral, and I show you that you can see the singularities, the soft and clear singularities, so I refer you to the notes for that. Let me just use my remaining time to write out the full result where I don't make any approximation. Uh, with dimensional regularization for the infrared singularity, pulling out the Born level result or the tree level result, I get some function of epsilon, and it's convenient to write it like this, kind of prefactor, and then I just get a series in one over epsilon. And so for this virtual piece, I get minus 1 over epsilon squared, minus 3 over 2 epsilon, minus 4. And then for the real piece, this is the same, this is the same, this is the same. And I get plus 1 over epsilon squared, plus 3 over 2 epsilon. And then I get a different constant, 19 over 4. And so you, so you see that when I add these two things, all the 1 over epsilons cancel. And that's the cancellation of the infrared divergences. And I'm left with a finite correction. And that's kind of quantum field theory at work. If you sum over everything, that's making an inclusive calculation. These degeneracies from the, the distinguishing the states are canceling out between these two type, different types of contributions. And I'm left with just a finite correction, which just depends on the strong coupling constant. OK, so that's kind of this sum over x, sum over i probabilities in action in this, in this simple example. So the thing that you should ask, though, uh, about this, there's a few different things. Well, one thing you could ask is what, is about, what about the scale for the strong coupling? At this order, none of those logarithms showed up. But at the next order, there'll be a logarithm of mu over q at one higher order in the strong coupling. And so you'll see that you want to pick the strong coupling at the scale of q, which is the scale of the collision. So that's not uh, maybe too surprising. Good scale choice. That will minimize logarithms, which only show up at the next order. And then there's a couple of other questions that you might ask about this, this result. We calculated this result entirely in terms of quarks and gluons. And so we were relying on this probabilistic interpretation of you know, that we collide these quarks and gluons. OK, we had three final state particles at most. Can we really compare this to a hadronic cross-section? And so something that might make you a little bit concerned if you look at the data is that when you compare the hadronic cross-section and you ask, how many hadrons do I get out of that hadronic cross-section, it's many more than three. So it's not just like this fundamental quark and gluon that we had in the final state, each of them turning into a hadron. It's more like 20 or 30. 
different hadrons that you find in the calculation. So can we really compare this quark and gluon calculation with a hadron cross-section? I want to talk about that a little bit more in the next lecture, and we'll do that using something called the operator product expansion. And we'll try to make more rigorous this idea of relating the probabilities for various things to happen. And then the other natural question here, which we'll also address next time, is what happens with restrictions on the radiation? Here we were freely integrating over all the phase space of the radiation. We'll have to come back and ask if we put some restrictions, how does that change things? And we'll do that again next time. And that'll get us into discussing jets and, and this parton shower type picture of producing the jets. We'll do that in lecture two. Thanks. Thank you.